opportunities to support BDS. Inclusion in a mainstream institutional Jewish space is not a given. We are very accustomed to being shunned. We are accustomed to being excommunicated. We are accustomed to losing friends and family members over this issue. I know many queer Jewish anti-Zionists who share my experience that it's actually harder to tell your family you oppose Zionism than it is to tell them you're queer. So whenever we are in a mainstream institutional Jewish space, we know we could get the axe at any second, and of course it did. So two months before the scheduled reading, I got a text in the middle of the night that the board had a secret meeting to cancel the program. But I was prepared mentally for this and very quickly snapped into gear, contacted all the press that I knew, wrote an op-ed, created a crowdfunding campaign to raise the budget to do it, reading independently. And within a couple of days, the public conversation, including in the New York Times, was very solidly sympathetic to me as a playwright who was being unfairly censored. And in turn, I was able to use this to spotlight, use the spotlight to talk about my experiences in Palestine and to signal boost the moment for justice there. So I knew, like, best case scenario, we do the play. Next best case scenario, something horrible happens to the play, but we get to talk about it and it becomes an issue where people wouldn't normally be discussing it and learning about it. But perhaps the most rewarding and interesting thing about this experience was the messages I got from liberal Zionist friends and family. After I was in the press, so many people reached out to say different versions of the same thing. For years, I've seen you talk about Palestine on social media, and it usually makes me really uncomfortable, and sometimes I disagree with you, but you've also challenged me to question my beliefs, and I'm further to the left on this than I was before, because of watching you. And this was really surprising and interesting to me, because I wouldn't have known this if they hadn't told me, and I've grown accustomed to thinking that social media is just a place of pointless arguments that go nowhere and convince no one. But I was thinking about the people I was arguing with. I wasn't thinking about the people who were just watching. And what I realized was, it's embarrassing for us to change our minds in front of someone. It's embarrassing to feel like you're losing an argument. It's, so if you argue with someone, it's very unlikely that you're going to change your mind in the argument. We prefer to change our minds in private. We like to observe a conversation or observe a controversial opinion and then change our minds without anyone watching. So we don't have to feel ashamed of having been wrong. And it's easier for us to make this transition when we see that someone else has already done it. We need a role model for a difficult political belief. It's almost like being queer in that it's easier to admit that you feel something if you know that other people already feel it and you see that they have support or momentum or you see that they are winning. Now, even though the forces that support Zionism have exponentially more power than the forces that don't, especially the forces of Christian Zionism, it's, this conversation usually focuses too much on the, the Jewish Zionist uh, uh, political infrastructure, but really Christian Zionism is like exponentially more powerful in terms of uh, money and numbers, and their, terif like their ideology is very anti-Semitic and terrifying. Um, but still, despite all of this power, I'm still very optimistic. Because like I said, Zionism has only been around for a little un over a hundred years. But I know that my ancestors' desire for justice and truth has been around a lot longer than that. And I know that their wisdom is with us, even if you can't always perceive it. And I'll leave you with a moment of, of revelation that I had around that. A few weeks after Trump's election, I found out that the Zionist Organization of America was going to give an award at their annual gala to Steve Bannon. Again, that's the Zionist Organization of America was giving an award to basically a Nazi. Only a couple weeks after the election, so there were like swastikas all over Brooklyn, and this is happening. And when I heard that this was happening, I started laughing. Because it's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous. And then my laughter, sort of melted into sobbing, because it's just terrifying. It's like, night, like what, what is this nightmare world I'm living in? And so I posted it on Facebook in this sort of manic jest 
I'm laughing and crying at the same time. There must be a Yiddish expression for this, but I don't know it because I don't speak Yiddish because the Nazis ran us out of Europe. You know, it's like the circular, but I'm laughing about Nazis. It's like the circular insanity, right? And something unexpected happened, which is someone commented, yeah, there is. There is a Yiddish expression for laughing and crying at the same time. Lachen mit yasht, lachen mit yasht stelkes. Which directly translated is laughing with lizards. And I found that image so beautiful and bizarre and sublime. And I started crying again because my ancestors wanted me to have that image. They made it for me. It was a gift. And that image belongs to me. But I didn't have access to it because my ancestors and I speak different languages. And like a lot of displaced people, like a lot of people in exile, like a lot of my Palestinian American friends, I dream in a language that I do not speak. But I believe in my dreams, and I believe in my ancestors, and I believe that the power driving us to justice is stronger than the power driving us to harm. Thank you so much for listening to me today. Peace be with you. Thank you so much. Please rise in body or spirit to sing hymn number 90.